All right, I want to thank everyone for joining us. Uh, this is the ACC NYC Women's Group third signature program for 2016. For those of you who are new to the Women's Group, the group launched in 2013 with the mission of supporting the advancement of women in the legal profession. My name is Penny Williams, and I'm currently co-chair of the steering committee of the Women's Group with my co-chair, Kim Bykov, who couldn't be here this evening. Um, I'd like to ask all the other steering committee members if you could just raise your hand quickly. If anyone would like to learn more about getting involved with the women's group, I encourage you to seek out one of these lovely ladies during the reception following the panel. I would also like to extend a special thanks to some of our programming members responsible for the programming this evening, Niovi Christopoulou, Elizabeth Lash, Daniel Manor, and Carrie Bowden. And I would like to extend a thanks to Roz Essex Cope and Amy Adams, whose hard work behind the scenes makes all of our ACC programming possible. We would like to ask you to please save the date for our fourth and final signature program of the year, which will take place on November 17th, sponsored by Hogan Levels. It's entitled Building Your Brand and Leveraging Your Value. We also encourage all of you to attend the All Abilities Legal Group Resources CLE on Best Practices for Employers on Monday, September 19th. Please also note that the chapter's annual meeting and half-day CLE is next Tuesday at the Paley Center for Media. If you can attend uh, and you haven't already submitted your e-proxy, uh, please see Roz during the reception. She can give you a paper ballot so we can make sure to get your vote in. Finally, I want to thank Kirkland, our sponsor for today's program, and introduce the moderator for today's discussion, Ashley Gregory. Ashley is a debt finance partner here at Kirkland & Ellis. She represents public and private corporate borrowers and private equity clients in connection with their complex financing transactions. Ashley was recognized in banking and finance by Chambers USA for 2014 through 2016 and recognized by the Legal 500 in 2014. She is the co-chair of the Gender Subcommittee of Kirkland's Diversity Committee and vice chair of the New York Office Recruiting Committee. If that's not enough, she also serves on Kirkland's <laughs> Associate Review and Operations Committees. Please join me in welcoming your Ashley. Thank you so much, Penny, and welcome all of you. I'm so pleased to welcome you here on behalf of Kirkland and Ellis. We are so proud to have been part of the ACC's women's group since its inception and to bring this amazing panel of women uh, to you today. So I'm just gonna briefly introduce the panelists and then have them talk in their own words about their paths because that really is the point of this panel. Um, Karen Gray is Director of Human Resources at America uh, for Christie's and until recently also served as Chief Operating Officer. Noga Rosenthal is Chief Privacy Officer of Epsilon. In her role as Chief Privacy Officer, Noga oversees all privacy-related activities for Epsilon and its conversant businesses, including global development, implementation, maintenance of, and adherence to the organization's policies and procedures covering privacy of and access to online and offline consumer data. Uh, Taya Grays is Vice President, Information Governance at MetLife. Um, as the lead of information governance, Taya is responsible for the strategic operation of information management governance for MetLife. She is responsible for creating and leading a team that will effectively develop, implement, and manage the information governance strategic plan, helping drive the initiative throughout the company. And finally, Melissa Gunn is currently working in global strategy at Pfizer as the Oncol as Global Oncology Strategy Innovation and Collaborations Lead, where she works on a broad set of projects focused on evolving the way Pfizer executes its clinical development programs. So welcome to all of you. Thank you for so generously sharing your experiences and advice with us tonight. Um, and so maybe if you could start. Um, thank you for having me here. I am. Um... Sorry, I'm still catching my breath because I, of course, was late from work, and the closer you work, the later you always are. So I just um, sprinted five blocks, it was a little, and then the elevator broke, so um, <laughs> I'm glad to be here. Uh, my career, I, I always thought I wanted to be a lawyer. I briefly wanted to be a psychologist um, until I took a psychology class in college, and somehow the professor made that course deadly boring. Um, and so I thought, well, what did I get a good grade in? Oh, I'll be a religion major. Um, and that was kind of the 19-year-old decision-making process. Um, I'm Catholic, and I wasn't going to become a nun, so a religion major was not a particularly useful um, career choice. Uh, so I went to law school, um, which might be a polar opposite of uh, religion major. 
Um, I, I, in law school, I wanted to be a litigator. I thought that was cool. I actually um, represented kids in the juvenile court, so I really thought I was going to be a trial lawyer. Um, I worked at Cadwallader after law school and rapidly realized I would never get to see the inside of a court because I was too busy writing memos and briefs. And I thought, I really hate to write, um, so instead I'll be a corporate lawyer and I'll just change names on incorporation certificates, um, and that's my career. Um, and, but I always knew I wanted to go in-house, so I did, I did eventually, after four years at the law firm, go in-house, and I went in-house to Reuters, where I began doing commercial work. And that was the beginning of my realization that I actually loved the business side of what we did. But it was still scary to me, so when people at Reuters, uh, one person said, would you be my COO? It's like, no way, I can't even use Excel. Like, that's not going to be a good career choice for me. Um, and I eventually got a call. Christie's was restructuring, and they needed a general counsel uh, for the Americas. I knew nothing about art. Um, I always admit there is one person here from Christie's, so I have to be a little careful, but I will admit that I don't actually like art. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I, was, I was hugely musical, so that was, that, I was like, I love the arts, and I think I did one of those kind of, I love the arts, um, at my interview, and somehow got the job. And next thing I knew, I was a general counsel, and that's what I had wanted to be. When I was a general counsel, I think it was 2008, so I was 37, and I thought, well, this is great. I have a good 30 more years of working. What am I going to do? Uh, and I, th through that, I worked very closely with the business. And I said, well, I can't look at another contract anymore. And I, there was a fortuitous moment when the president of the region, his right-hand person moved for personal reasons. And I said, I would love to help you. And we had worked so closely together that he said, great. And I became his chief of staff, um, which then migrated into becoming chief administrative officer, chief operating officer. And Christie's has had a revolving door of HR people. And they said, through these roles, you've done a lot of HR work. Would you come head our HR department? And so um, since uh, August, I was doing it temporarily. And officially, as of February, I became head of HR for the region. And I will say, it is the best job I have ever held um, in my entire, my entire 45 years. So I, I've reached the career that I actually know where I want to be and what I want to do. <laughs> Okay, here we go. I think I need reading glasses. Um, my name is Noga Rosenthal, and I um, started at DLA Piper. And then, ironically, I went to Sotheby's, actually, uh, Christie's competitor. Um, and I, I actually said, I don't, I'm not into art, and that's why they hired me. Um, they wanted somebody not involved in art who um, would just, again, what Karen and I talked about, would just review contracts and review the laws that were affecting uh, Sotheby's. Um, had a kid, took off some time, and ended up very randomly um, at a tech company. Um, it's actually where I wanted to be, um, but I came out of law school during the, uh, the bubble burst in 2002. Um, so I went to 24-7, which is a WPP company. It's an advertising tech company. Um, and privacy started being a very important part of what I was doing. It was nothing at the beginning, but as more privacy issues came up, the more um, I dealt with uh, data protection and reviewing laws, going down to DC and lobbying. Um, so my job became just much bigger than it was. And just like Karen, I also became GC at, at a relatively young age, and, and I was also like, well, what's next? Um, and so I went in-house to um, an industry group and started setting rules for the whole industry around privacy for ad tech. Um, and then Epsilon came and asked me to be their chief privacy officer. So at that point, I knew I was shedding um, any legal work that I was doing anymore, moving more to the chief privacy officer side, the more um, compliant side of uh, the company. And it's not easy. I think it's hard to give up the, the legal side after working so many years um, trying to build your career, but it's been, it's been a fascinating field. Um, I, I will say just one thing is just take opportunities when they come up. Um, uh, and, and again, we'll talk more about that. So my career path is probably a little bit different than everyone else's. I didn't start off at a law firm. I was a prosecutor in the Bronx and made a decision that, um, driven by um, finances, um, as well as 
<laughs> great job, doesn't pay a lot of money. Um, and I had loans, as we all did. And I also didn't see myself as a career prosecutor. So I wanted to make sure that I was a balanced uh, litigator. And I had always wanted to be a litigator. I always wanted to be a lawyer. So when I went in-house, I did that at MetLife. But there came a point where I was trying to figure, and I guess we were all sort of at these inflection points. You know, what's next? I've been doing litigation, and I want to be promoted within the company. How can I accomplish that? So at one point, I had a, well, this goes to one of the things I'm actually going to talk about, so I'll save it for a little bit later. But needless to say, I had a conversation with a certain someone, and that certain someone made a, a recommendation about a job that reported to that certain someone. And I actually did that job for about six years. It was being chief of staff to the general counsel. And that job sort of has an operational component to it. And I know we talked about doing the chief of staff kind of stuff. And it's a great transitional job that we can talk a bit more about. And then from that job, I then took a piece of the job that I had. And that's the information governance piece. It was one of a few different hats that I wore at the time, but as I was thinking about what's my next step, I said, this is really a position that has a global impact on the company, and it's kind of quasi-law, but a bunch of other things connected to it, and I thought it would be a great way of moving, sort of kind of connected to the law, but doing something that, you know, as you were saying with privacy, something that is becoming this emerging area, information governance. It's not records management. It's records management plus. Not more than that, um, but it's a it's a new area within the law, within compliance, within operations, and something that a lot of corporations are really focusing on because there's lots of issues as to how you migrate your information and how do you manage and leverage your information across the organization. Thanks. Hi, um, I'm Melissa Gunn. I I, uh, st I did start in the corporate law firm, so I spent seven years as a corporate lawyer doing um, banking, structured finance, securities law, um, sort of the whole gamut of things at two different law firms, at Simpson Thatcher and then at Covington and Burling before I realized I'd just gotten married and I wanted to have kids and I was worried I might never see them. Um, and then I also really thought, oh my God, like I, I just left um, the office at 3 a.m. and the partner left at 1 a.m. And I guess he probably makes a lot more money than I make, but he left at 1 a.m. I'm like, is that really what you want um, at the end of the day? So I just did the something I never do. I picked up the phone when you see the caller ID, you don't know who it is, and it happened to be a headhunter. And um, she was saying that maybe I should come work in the transactions group doing M&A at Pfizer. So I did that for five years, um, and then I realized I've been at Pfizer for five years and all I know is how to do deals and you can do deals kind of in any space and you need to know a little bit, but you, it's not really, I'm like, I need to learn a little bit more about the business. So Pfizer was reorganizing at that time into uh, different business units. There were a lot of different um, jobs that were coming available and I wanted to both uh, work for someone I hadn't worked for before, so a new manager, and I also wanted to learn more about the business. So I took what I considered to be a transition job that I, actually knew that I was not going to love even when I signed up to do it um, as a product attorney because I wanted to learn more about the business. So I thought, oh my God, I'm taking this job. I don't even know if I could do it for 12 months. Um, but I did it and I actually ended up staying for a few years partly because I had some personal things. I had my second child and my mother was sick and dying and it was a very uh, regular schedule. So I think you do different things in your career um, at different times for different reasons. And then after I kind of looked up and got through some of those personal issues, I, I actually spent a ton of time networking and talking to people at Pfizer and talking to lawyers. And I always thought, oh, my, my goal is to be like the GC at a biotech company someday. So and then I was like, I need to learn more. And I talked to all the chief counsels at Pfizer who sort of were are like the mini GCs in our company. And I realized I didn't want to be any of them either. Um, so then I was really stuck and wondering what should I do next. And I, um, again, I just started talking to a lot of people. And I, it's interesting that, that the transitions that the lawyers have made, I also took like kind of a chief of staff role, um, which is, a, it is a perfect transition role um, for reasons I guess maybe we'll talk about later, um, because you get to see across the business. So after you see that, it helps you to kind of know where you want to go next. So I, the, the, sec the next role I took was, actually a, a P&L role where I ran sales and marketing um, and had to deliver a revenue line for products. So I did that for the last two years. And then about seven months ago, I took a new job um, in the global strategy group at, at um, Pfizer and Oncology. So that's sort of the short version of what I've done. Thanks, guys. So starting at the beginning, uh, Karen, what 
piqued your interest in making the, the, the move to the, biz, to the business side? It sounds like it was pretty organic for you. Yeah, it was very organic. I think it was constantly evaluating what interested me. Um, you know, I decided to become a corporate lawyer because I found that to be more interesting in the end. I decided to do commercial work because I found that to be more interesting in the end. Um, and when I realized I love commercial work, one of the things I found being an in-house attorney was you were the most effective when you knew the business. And Reuters was a great place to do that. Now Thomson Reuters, but then just Reuters was a great place to do that learning and spend time with the business people. And I loved talking to them about their products and the commercials around their products and why things are priced a certain way. So I recognized I had a passion of, for that much more than I had a passion for um, just marking up contracts. I also, as I took on more management roles, realized I love managing people. So for me, it was a bit of a natural, I, you love managing people, you love commercial, well then obviously a business side role is the place where it makes most sense for you to be. And so once you kind of focus on that, Melissa, how did you identify the business area that was a good fit for you? So, I mean, I think for me, I guess maybe I have a short attention span. Um, also, why I was a transaction lawyer instead of a litigator, um, I think in large part. But um, it, I spent a lot of time thinking not so much about what do I want to do, but what am I good at and what, what kinds of things do I like to do? So not whose job, do, who has a job that I want, but what are the skill sets that I think that I have and where are my strengths and where do they fit kind of within the business? And also, you know, sort of more mundane things, like what is the cadence of my day? Like what do I like to be doing all the time? Um, and I also um, thought I wanted to try sort of running teams and managing people. I'd never done that before, so that helped me in my, um, when I had my P&L job. Uh, there, where I was really leading people at the same time that I was leading the organization. But for me, it's about the pace, I think, of, of the work. I like things that are very fast moving, um, and I like to not be doing the same thing every day. And so when you have responsibility for a business, I would be meeting with customers one day, I would be with my sales team another day, I would be um, in financial reviews um, a different day, we'd be trying to talk to patients and understanding our customers. There's a whole range of things, and every day um, is a little bit of a surprise and is different and and also when you're leading an organization you're sort of triaging in some ways all the time and so for me it was about sort of thinking about the skills that I want and then networking and spending a ton of time talking to people everyone I know about what is the job you do what are you, what's the, your day-to-day -day like what do you like about your job what do you not like about the job what are the skills that you think you need and trying to figure out if I had those skills and if I didn't have those skills how could I raise my hand and volunteer for a project where I could get those skills or where I could get exposure to certain people that I felt like I needed to know um, to, to, to transition into a role. Great. And so obviously communication is so important. Taya, how did you communicate your interest in transitioning to the business side? So like I said earlier, I had this conversation with a certain someone about a new position. So I had been at MetLife for about five years and at each point of like every five years it was sort of an inflection point for me. Where am I? And I think we, we've all kind of talked about this. Where am I? What am I doing? And where am I going next? What's the next place where I want my career to go? So one of my colleagues from the diversity committee, um, we were co-chairs of one of the subcommittees, and I was chatting with her about you know, next steps, and we were just talking generally. And she said, well, why don't you go and have a, how she describe it, oh, a one meeting mentoring session with the GC? So I said, well, well, that sounds like a good idea. And he had talked about he couldn't have long-term mentoring relationships, but if you wanted to come up and meet with him for lunch or meet with him you know, for an hour, then he would provide that kind of mentoring. Um, and this is, for those of you who are here at MetLife, it was like three GCs ago. <laughs> I worked for three GCs, six years, three different GCs. So the GC who hired me to be his chief of staff had said, oh, you could do this, you could do that, but why don't you consider my chief of staff role? Now, I had already been thinking that, but I'm like, okay, I got that validation. He's thinking the same thing, too. So I actually didn't do it right away. I waited for another year. There, were, um, there was a case that I was working on that I wanted to finish. Actually, the case outlasted me, as litigation goes, and the opportunity to apply for the position. It was a rotational job. Every two years, there, well, 
at, at that time, it was every two years, um, you would go into that position. And at the time, again, I wanted to find an opportunity to advance in the organization and you know, just sort of real talk. Sometimes you, you can't move up. There are other people that are ahead of you and from seniority perspective, and they're, you know, how do you get those opportunities? So when the announcement came around the, the two years later, the chief of litigation forwarded the email to me and said, do you want to apply? I think you should apply. I was like, okay, I guess I should consider applying. And at that time, she said, look, you know, if you want to advance in the organization, you need to get out from behind so-and-so, so-and-so, and so-and-so. So you should take this job, and that will allow you to have something else, um, another set of experiences so that it puts you in a position to be promoted. So I said, that makes sense. So I ended up taking the position. And it's not, it's legal on a very, very high level. Because I was the chief of staff for the general counsel. But it was running the department on his behalf. So you're dealing with HR issues, tons and tons of <laughs> HR issues, which I'm sure we can talk about later. Um, managing budgets, dealing with strategy, um, enterprise-wide initiatives, and helping him to prepare for his various meetings. So I thought, great, I'll be in this job for two and a half years, maybe three, and then I'll move on to something else. He hired me, and then five months, no, actually, he told me maybe the maybe four months before I actually started the job. I knew I was in the job, and I wasn't starting until January. So he called me and his current chief of staff into his office, and he put a piece of paper in front of both of us, and we both looked at it. And then first we're reading it, and then we kind of skimmed down, like, okay, what's the punchline? He was retiring. So... I was in the role with him for five months, and then he retired. And then the next gentleman came in, and that was great. And we were, you know, we had a good vibe going. I'm thinking, okay, what am I going to do, you know, at the conclusion of the two and a half years? So he and I took a car ride about two and a half years later, and then he did like this. And I'm like, really? <laughs> <laughs> he retired. And so then I was on my third GC. At the time, we were talking about what should I do, where should I go? And there really wasn't a place for me to go in the organization. So I said, well, I'll wait for the next GC. And he said he would speak to him. And so then, so that's Ricardo, for those of you who are here um, from MetLife. So I ended up working for Ricardo for another almost three years. And at that point, I said, I really do need to make a transition. I was the longest serving, probably the longest serving chief of staff at MetLife to an executive group member. And it was just time to transition to something else. But I wasn't ready to be a lawyer. Again, I was, I was sizing up my options. But the bottom line is, it's around communication. I have spoken to my manager. I have spoken to the head of litigation as well about wanting to do something more and being open to other opportunities. And based on, you know, as Melissa was saying, you kind of think about what your skill set is. And for the chief of staff job, I had a really good skill set for doing that. Um, so it's letting people know what you're interested in. And it may not turn around right away, but when that opportunity came up, and you know, she and the chief of litigation, I had been in conversations with each other. When that came out, she's like, you should do this because she already knew what my interests were. So don't be shy. I mean, maybe be discreet, but don't be shy. <laughs> you know, because you have to tell the right people about what you want to do. You, you have to be balanced in that. But you need to tell people what your interests are. People can't read your mind. And your manager may have a good reach, but may not have as broad a reach. So you got to talk to as many people as you feel comfortable in order to communicate what your interests are so you can find out about those opportunities. Because not everything is posted. So critical to make those mm -hmm. connections and to get that kind of inside information on navigating. Karen, how did you uh, ensure the visibility and alliance is necessary to make the move and who sponsored your transition? So I am a horrible networker. Um, and when we were on the call, I think you'll get much better networking advice from this side of the panel. Um, I don't, it's one of the reasons I didn't stay in a law firm is that I knew to be a successful partner, you actually have to be a great network and a rainmaker. Um, and I uh, am an utter cocktail party failure. And um, if you stand near me, I will trap you. You will never go to the bathroom. You will never get a drink. Um, I can't, so I'm not good at it. Uh, so so I, I, give this, I, I give this advice to all the introverts in the room who, uh, who likewise uh, find it really painful. Um, I, I, I'm afraid I did a little bit of that female thing, which is if you work really hard, you'll get noticed. Um, and I was lucky because I work in a place that is very female friendly. Christie's has an incredible um, seniority level, senior level of women in the company. Um, we, uh, and we have kind of very um, aware men as well. So 
I don't know if this is good advice for most companies, but for Christie's that worked well because they saw people that worked hard. Um, and I also just organically tried to make the right relationships with people, but not from a, so I can get to the next level. I find that comes across, can come across as a little bit false if you're not good at it. And again, I'm not good at that. So it was a lot of it is like, I'm just interested in you as a person. We became friends, and in the course of that friendship, you happen to know what I'm interested in and what I'm doing. So I, I took a, um, a little bit more of the organic way, which is working super hard, then getting into the right spaces so people could see how I'd work and that I would give them good advice. And so they had in the head, oh, this is a person who gives good advice. And then also just becoming friendly with a number of people who knew me and said, oh, there's an opening here, and actually she's ready for the next step. Um, so it's, it's, it's not the most targeted political way of going about things, but it did work for me. And can I just add something to that about what it means to be sponsored? I mean, you can have mentors who point you in directions. You can have your managers who identify where you should go. But a sponsor is usually someone that is behind the scenes who you don't know is advocating for you. But because, as Karen demonstrated, there were things that she was doing just doing the job, doing good work, meeting people. I'm sure Melissa probably did the same thing. So when the opportunities arose, someone was at the table to say, you know what, we've seen her. She's doing a good job and can advocate on your behalf. So it, it is organic, but there are things you can do by getting good assignments, working outside of your comfort zone and doing a good job that can help you develop that sponsor network. Um, and so when you were having these conversations, what did your business colleagues think your value add was as a lawyer, and what skills and perspective do you think lawyers bring to the table? Yeah, I mean, I think it, it really depends on your company. So Christie's is high, it's an art, it's the art world. So we have a lot of high creative people. We're very similar to the fashion world in that sense. So one of the things they loved about the lawyers was we didn't get emotional with them. So when somebody's screaming, oh my God, we're about to lose the picture, the louder their voice got, the softer my voice got. Um, and that was super valued in the organization. Now, I will say you have to adjust, right? Working at Reuters, that's much more of a sales organization. So to be successful there, I mean, had a little bit more of a potty mouth, you know, a little bit more direct. But that, but that worked there. That would not work at Christie's. Um, so I, I, and this is what people will say constantly and why I ended up in HR is the ability to stay calm um, and logical and process-based, which is what every single good lawyer brings to the table in the midst of chaos. So, I mean, I guess I'll just make a comment too, which is I think um, Taya talked about um, going out of your comfort zone. You know, I think a lot of times lawyers think of themselves as lawyers and they put themselves at a box. So I would say one thing that I think I did that made a difference, and I wasn't even doing it on purpose partly, I just have a big mouth and it was hard for me to stop myself, but when I'm at the table with the business, right, and we're discussing issues, I'm not only commenting on legal issues, right? I'm commenting on things that I think make business sense or I'm asking questions to try to understand the business better. And so I think then they really start to see you as a partner. Um, so I think sometimes we put ourselves in a box and you don't always have to do that. And so you can start to expand your universe and people start to see what you're capable of and that you're capable of doing a lot more, but you have to kind of be willing to show that. And just, I, I want to add to that, I, I think the common theme is that in order to do a deal, in order to litigate, you have to understand the business. You have to know where the risks are. You have to understand, you know, I, I know I'm hearing it over and over. You, you really do start understanding the business from beginning to end, right? So you get the painting in your hand. What, what happens at that point? Who has the risk? Does Christie's have the risk or is it, does it, you know, when does that risk pass to you? So you learn about... The, the insurance side. Then you learn about um, taxes. You know, where do you send the painting? What are the tax implications? And all of a sudden, people start coming to you not just for legal questions, but for everything else too. And that's really when the transition, I think, starts happening. It's because I, I and maybe this is being a lawyer. Maybe that's one of the skills you learn. You have to know the deal from beginning to end to really be a, an effective lawyer. And because of that, because you learn the business, you become a much an, an effective business person, in essence. Were there other skills that you needed in, in, in transitioning that were essential to you in transitioning to that business side? Yeah, one of the funniest lessons I learned early on was from a salesperson who, on, on deals where we had the salesperson and a legal person on the other side was be quiet, let them talk. 
and sometimes people would just dig a hole and, and they talk themselves out of a, a term that they were very adamant on a minute ago. So that was an interesting, like, just listening. It's okay, you know, you, we don't have to know everything. Sometimes it's, it's okay to let them speak and, and let them uh, offer another viewpoint that maybe they, they argue themselves out of their, their issue. We were talking about this on our call. I mean, a very, very practical skill is being numerate. You don't have to have an advanced degree, but there are very few business roles where you don't have to be numerate and actually be able to look at um, you know, a financial statement or a spreadsheet. And even in HR, so you would think it's HR, it's people. But every time I have to do comp um, on the fly and you're, you know, you're running multiple numbers and you're doing percentages, you have to be numerate. Like I actually did three hardcore Excel courses um, in the last month just so I could do the formulas and do the VLOOKUPs and do what everything, everybody else knows. And that's an HR. Um, and it was, it, there was as much in data processing and when I was doing the pure commercial side as well. So it's a little hard if you're a lawyer and uh, some of these careers if you don't have um, a facility, some basic facility with the numbers. So make nice, get to know your controller or your finance person, particularly in the chief of staff jobs, that's a big part of what your responsibility is in managing that budget, making budget recommendations. So in addition to my general counsel rotating, we had different finance people. So in the beginning, it's just the way the organization reorganized. So the first person was showing me. The second person, he and I were kind of like, okay, we're on the same wavelength here. By the time the third person came, okay, this is the driver. This is what we do. We do this, we do that. But that was because I kept constantly asking the questions and as lawyers, even if you're like deal lawyers, I mean, you have some facility with numbers, but this is different. This is budgeting. This is expenses and understanding why you have like what a forecast is and what a run rate is. And those aren't concepts that you're, you generally are dealing with if you're just either on a deal, you're doing basic arithmetic. It's budgeting and finance. And so I wish, we were talking about this on our call, I wish I had taken a finance course before just to understand that budgeting component. But once you get in the job and you make sure you talk to people and you sit down and you ask them, I would sit down with them with an hour, let's go through all of this and explain this to me so that I really had that understanding because ultimately I'm talking to the GC and I'm like, I need to understand what this means so I don't look silly and I need to understand the numbers so that I can explain it to him. I mean, at the end of the day, we all work for, most people I think are working for for-profit companies and the bottom line matters and you need to understand what the business drivers are. So you don't, everyone does not need to know how to run an Excel spreadsheet. Super impressive uh, and, and real grit there, Karen. But, um, <laughs> but you, you need to understand what the drivers are for the business. So I, I don't have to know how to make the cells all work neatly, but I need to know when I'm looking at those numbers, you know, what is behind them and what drives them and what, which ones matter and which ones don't and, which, and how you can tell if they're you know, suspect or if you need to ask more questions. So it's about asking questions and getting educated, I think, at the end of the day. And one other thing that I think as lawyers, we are so used to knowing everything. Now, yes, you do need to know a deal from one end to the other, but when you get into the business role, you don't need to know every single thing. You have to be comfortable, one, with not having all of the information. You're not going to get 99% of what you need. So you're going to have to use your judgment based on what you know. What do you think is the right course of action? I think for lawyers, we're so used to, let's keep doing the research. Let's keep finding that case and figuring out if there is something out there. You can't Considering the situation, sometimes you don't have enough time and sometimes you just don't need all of that information. So being comfortable with not having 100%. And the other thing is being comfort, comfortable with ambiguity. You know, things aren't always going to be clear, particularly, you know, in, in the business setting. And there are gray areas and you're going to have to make a call. And as lawyers, you know, we're used to sizing everything up and this is what our opinion is. But in the business role, you have to make the decision. And you have to be comfortable with making that decision when you don't have all the information and things are kind of gray and trusting your judgment that you are going to land in the right place. That's, that actually make, reminds us that, you know, I think it's a really, one way you could really shine sort of as a lawyer even in a business type of setting is to make a call. So off, too often lawyers will say, well, this is one side, right, here's the benefits and here are the risks. And they never really give you an answer. 
as you just heard Taya say, the business is having to make decisions every day on the fly. We never have all the information. We don't expect to have all the information. You make a decision. And we're looking for guidance, right? So they're always looking for ways to quantify what you're saying. Is it a 50% or more chance risk that this is going to happen? Is it an 80% chance risk of happening? And the more that you can show that you understand what the business is up against and sort of um, figure out how to give your advice in a way that they understand what to do with that advice and it actually helps them to make a decision. A bullet point list of the 85 things that could go wrong, you know, we're trained to look for risk, doesn't really help them because they don't know what the probability is that any of those things are going to happen. So it's not enough just to lay out the risks for, um, for, for the, the clients that you're working for, but you really have to find a way to kind of quantify it and make it real for them. Hey, did you find there were negative prejudices against lawyers in your transition or since it's the women's group, female lawyers in particular, and how did you deal with that? Well, I didn't personally, well, in my prior job as a prosecutor, yeah, there were certainly prejudices. So that's a, a different environment. But at MetLife, I haven't found that. But I think one of the things we talked about on the call is that Sometimes it's just the in general environment that we know that there are perceptions about women. Um, and it could be little things, you know, that you may say A, and then the guy down the table says A, and you're like, well, I did say that, didn't I, right? <laughs> so understanding how to be more powerful and capturing your voice, and if someone does say that, well, you know, thank you, Bob, for, you know, confirming what I just said or validating or agreeing, right? You have to understand what those, um, what those tricks are to make sure that your voice is still powerful. But I, I, we were talking about this on a call, although I haven't reset anything personally, I think women do need to make sure that we keep those things in mind, that we don't sink back into some of the things that we've silently been kind of trained to do or things that we're comfortable with doing. Women always want to make consensus, make sure everyone is on the same table. And sometimes you're not going to get everyone on the same table. And you have to be able to make that decision. If there are people who you can't bring on board, say, okay, this is a decision that needs to be made. So it's understanding what those general kind of societal perceptions are that we're all working within. Because it's not going to be, in some instances it may be, but it's usually not overt. But it's behind the scenes. So being mindful about that and thinking about some of the strategies that you can employ so that you don't default to what those societal perceptions are and that you can make sure that you're advancing your cause and making sure your decisions and your voice is being heard. And since we're on this topic, maybe jumping to uh, you know, having been on both sides, do you think that being a female lawyer or a businesswoman in a company is similar? Are the gender-based issues similar? I mean, Melissa? Um, you know, I, I think it really depends on understanding your environment, wherever you are, whether it's at a law firm or a company. Um, and, and I think the issues are different and the culture is different everywhere, so it's important to know that. So for me, I, you know, I've now been advisor for 12 years, even though I've had five roles there. The legal division, I felt like there were a lot of women models. And I think having women role models actually does make a difference. So whether you're on the business side or not, um, women lead in a different way than men do. And so I think if you're only in an environment where you're only or surrounded by men in senior positions, it doesn't help you to grow and to kind of see where you need to go next. So I think that's a challenge. I mean, as an M&A, junior M&A lawyer, right, I would be the most junior person. And I'm Asian, so I look sometimes younger already than people in the room. And there, I'd be the only woman in a room of 25 people when we were doing deals, right? That's a tough environment to be at. Pfizer isn't like that, and I think it's a really great company um, for women, but I've found, I'm just now sort of seeing the first women on the business side and really working closely with them to kind of see how they work, and it is a totally different experience. And I guess I'll just, it's not exactly on topic, but on the kind of like the gender topic, I, I know Karen thinks that, you know, I'm a big networker on my side, and I talked about it because I think it's really important. I did the Myers-Briggs when I was at Kid Wilder, Karen, as a summer associate. I think I did an assignment for Karen. I'm trying to figure out how I know her. But um, I actually come out as an I because I also am a nightmare in a cocktail party and I only talk to the one person that I know and I'm not going to go around and talk to people. But I have trained myself over many years and I practice at parents' night at school um, <laughs> going out and talking to more people and shaking hands and just 
pretending to be really friendly, even though I don't feel really friendly all the time. And, and the other thing is, you know, you have to be willing to ask for help. So particularly if you're transitioning in a new role and you don't always know what you're doing. I have many days, every day, they ask me to do something I've never done before. Um, so uh, you have to be willing to ask for help and you have to be comfortable talking to strangers. It's just part of kind of the way the corporate world works. And in general, I would say men are more comfortable doing that and they're more comfortable going to someone and saying, hey, uh, I gotta do X, have you done it? Show me your thing and, you know, and, and they'll share or they'll, you know, but you have to be able to do that. And what I've found is I have never, asked someone to meet with me and uh, make a little time, even if I just wanted to learn about their job and understand what it is that they do to see if it's something that I wanted to do. No one's ever said no to me. And there are people that, I, you know, I'm uh, reaching out to people, oh, so-and-so said you might be a good person to talk to. So they're not people that I know. And I'm actually not an extrovert. Um, and I, but it is so important to get comfortable doing those things. And it will really help you be successful. And guys ask each other for favors all the time and never think twice about it. And we ask someone for a favor and we feel guilty about taking up their time and you don't need to and it's not it doesn't help you in the business world to kind of think that way so after having made the transition Karen how relevant are your legal skills and which skills translated particularly well um, so I it, it is that process point and again it has to do with the tenor of the organization um, the ability to think through a complicated issue and not panic and realize that complexity can be distilled down to simplicity, um, that is applicable in any role that you would take in the business. And I've used it when I was doing business development, I've used it when I was COO, and I certainly use it in HR. Um, so that, is, and then that's what people look for. They look for somebody that can, when, we're, when everything's crazy, project manage and put in place a decent process. So I always look at legal because people can get very specific, like I do contracts very well or I know intellectual property. That's not relevant. You know, I'm not using, a, I was doing some intellectual property with Christie's. I am not using that in HR. Um, so, but it's the kind of broader based skills that I think you bring if you're going to be a, a good in-house lawyer. Um, the decision making I think is incredibly key, that ability to say X and Y and I'm gonna choose it and I'm, I'm comfortable with the risk knowing that and I have, I have been sued. Uh, you know, you don't always make the right decision and you, you kind of have to get used to that fear. That is actually what I think is the most useful piece in the business world and what people have been looking for. And Taya, what additional skills did you have to learn on the job post-transition? So I already talked about that finance thing. Um, and so we, I think we've all had that type of issue because unless you take a course in school, and they, maybe they're offering it now, but when I went to law school, they didn't have those kind of courses about finance. The other thing is HR. And, and Karen's saying through the course of the jobs that she's had, you've learned the HR. When you manage people, people bring whatever they have from home and their personalities to the office. And there were times where I had people say to each other on my team, you know, well, I don't like her. And I'm like, really? <laughs> we're here, you know, we're professionals. We, you know, you got to put that aside. But it, we work at a corporation, but those things come up. The crazy and silly and stupid things that people do. But you have to be able to manage that. You have to be able to document it. You have to be able to talk to people, even though you're thinking, why the, what were you thinking? But you have to be able to convey that in a, a productive way and say, you know, this is what you did and this is what happened and this is what the implications are and now, you know, this is what we're going to do next. And as lawyers, you don't learn how to manage people. And for those of you who work at law firms, you know that in spades. And hopefully, you know, Ashley, you're probably a much better manager, but it's not a skill that lawyers learn. And a lot of professionals don't really learn how to manage people. But when you're in the, on the business side, particularly in a more senior role, your job is to manage people. And you have to get them to produce results, to achieve your goals because you can't do it by yourself. So you have to be effective at managing people. You have to be able to talk to them. You have to be able to understand their concerns, no matter how crazy or what kind of bad day they have. You have to keep them motivated so they don't leave because when they do leave, going through an HR process, doing a job description, and then talking to HR to do recruiting and then seeing all these people, it takes a lot of time. So you wanna make sure that you can keep your people motivated. And I didn't learn any of that before going into the chief of staff job. And a lot of what I did was around HR. My HR business partner, we're friends now because we talk to each other 
every day. She had my cell phone number. I had her work cell and her personal cell. So if she called me, like if I was on the call, I would send her an email. Okay, I can't talk right now, but what do you need? But that was the kind of relationship we had because of the nature of the work that I did required us to spend a lot of time putting programs together. So if you are thinking about going onto the business side in a more senior role, learn how to manage people. And it's also management and leadership. Right? Managing people is really kind of making sure they do A, B, C, and D. But being a leader is how do you motivate people and keep them interested in their jobs so that you are all functioning as a team. So HR and finance are two key things to get some prep work on before transitioning into a business role. Uh, Nova, what is your relationship with the legal department post-transition? So. I mean, I speak to the legal department on a daily basis because privacy does affect um, everything. Um, so all our, we're, I come from a data company, so that's, you know, our asset is data. Um, and so I work very, very closely with the legal team to ensure that they understand where the risks are, what, what language we should be negotiating. Um, so so there's, there's definitely a very, very close relationship and there's an education piece where you know, trying to explain to them um, what HIPAA is, can spam. Um, it's, I think the, you know, a lot of times you get people thinking that they know things and, and it's like, no. And so, <laughs> so there is, a, there's definitely, um, but, but some people know more than me. And that's where I, I, again, I just sit quietly and I learn from others. So it's, it's a give and take. I think nobody is a worse client than an ex-lawyer. Um, I, I mean, my God, I, I, I feel for our legal team, you know, especially on the HR side, right? Because I left general counsel and moved over. So I have a little bit of a, why aren't you doing this right away? Like, why aren't I as an important client? I've become the people that I hated. Um, and I recognize that and it's, and it's hard. And so I think when you make the move, I would say for the benefit of, and, and please tell Jason that I said this, um, for the benefit of people that remain in the legal department, um, remember how it felt and don't completely cross over to what we call the dark side. Mm -hmm. And they have other clients th than you that people will do things a little bit differently. Um, but at the same time, it's also knowing I'm much more able to speak to legal. So before people in HR, they might ask something and you'd have confusion because they didn't know legal terms or shorthand. And it allows me, especially in the HR side, to do a little bit more shorthanding. And so I think when it works well, it actually works more efficiently. Karen, what do you think the benefits of making the transition to the business side were or, or specifically for you? Um, well, happiness. Um, so <laughs> the, um, look, for me, it's, I, I found my passion. I mean, so um, I'll speak in generally. Generally, business people get paid more than lawyers. Um, generally, they have bigger budgets than lawyers do. Uh, because they are, and I'm not talking HR now, when I was in the revenue producing side, because you are on the revenue producing side. So you have a lot more leeway in what you can do, and you find that you can be treated very differently in a way that you hadn't been treated before when you were, quote unquote, a support function or a cost center. So that's a, you know, that's a kind of great thing to have happen, but I, I've kind of now migrated back to a different support function. Um, I just like the ability that you are completely at the table. I, I think even as general counsel, like I would be at the table and you think you know what's happening, but then when you go into the business side, you realize there's an entirely new world of conversation and discussion and fundamental um, understanding of what your company is doing that you never saw as a lawyer because you just got brought in at a different time. Even if they brought you in early, that's still not an early for the business. Um, and so I found that part, like, you know your company, that's the, that is the fun part of being on the business side, is that you are literally from ground zero at the table and making strategic decisions. They are asking you for, you're, you are shaping the company for the future. I find that, I, I just, I'm so passionate about it because I just think that is so much more fun than with respect, uh, getting a contract and marking it up and getting excited that you did a big deal, but knowing that you started that deal and saw it to the end is phenomenal. Well, I'll say it's having the ability to have a broader impact beyond legal, that you can put in place initiatives, you're working across the organization to make more impactful, impactful changes in the business, and taking that legal knowledge, I mean, you're all, we're always going to be a lawyer. We've been trained, that is a part of who we are, but it's how you leverage that, and you become a business person, 
with a legal background. And if you're looking to, even if you're making that transition, you may not want to be an operating officer, you want to do some other role in the business, you have to stop thinking of yourself as a lawyer. You have to think of yourself, I'm, we all work for a corporation. We're lawyers, that's part of, that's what our job is, but we are business people in this corporation that bring a legal skill set. So if you start thinking of yourself in that way, then you're thinking about risk, you're thinking about enterprise-wide strategy, and you're putting yourself in the place of the clients that you represent internally. And that mindset is very important when you're looking to make that transition. You can't just be, well, I'm a lawyer and I'm looking to be on the business side. You have to make sure people understand that I know I'm a lawyer, but I bring this other skills or I have this other mindset about how I'm thinking about my job vis-a-vis -vis the company and achieving what they need to do. No, I saw you nodding. Is there yeah. anything you want? <laughs> um, I just, um, I just find this fascinating. It's just, you know, very different paths. I think a lot of it's just, I hate to say it, some of it's love. Um, I do want to go back just for a second to the networking point, just for a second. I, I was the same way. I, I didn't want to network. And it was, you know, I had kids. I was like, I, I don't feel like going out tonight. But I actually, I went on maternity leave, and the person who replaced me I actually started getting calls from my outside counsel, my paralegal. This woman's trying to take your job. So when I came back, I had an overlap with this person, and I saw she networked like Crazy. She got the job with me because she was networking, um, and so it was a good lesson to learn that, you know, even even if it's against your grain, even if you just want to go home, um, it, it's crucial today, especially with trying to get the next job, um, trying to make whatever step it is to network because it, you can't just send in your resume anymore. It really is trying to get in front of the HR person. I think it's important to have that, have somebody go in and hand the resume to them. Um, that's how my, my current job, my, my ex, you know, the president that I used to work for called me up and said, hey, you'd be great for this. Um, so again, I, I can't emphasize, I actually think that's one of the biggest, most crucial things is network within your company and network outside of your company, make friends. Um, and that, that's the biggest lesson I learned. Keep your LinkedIn page updated. So we are um, at time, so I think we uh, will open the floor up to questions if anyone would like to ask our panelists. Hi. Did any of you have concerns about uh, leaving your legal career behind, thinking that maybe you would go to the business side and find that, in fact, you would like to redirect down the road back to the legal side, and would you have trouble doing that? You know, did, and if that was something that occurred to you, how did you reconcile that? I definitely did. Um, and in fact, I, I kept my general counsel position up until last year I was doing double duty. Uh, and I was lucky that I was in a company that allowed me to do that. So I was GC and chief of staff and GC and CAO and GC. And when I became COO, that's when I finally let it go. And I had two years of recognizing I was ready to let it go. Because it is scary. Because you, you do think, suppose this doesn't work. The tricky thing about being on the business side is when you're in legal, it's very clear what your job is. You know, it is, you get contracts, you know. When you're on the business side, it is not as clear. Like even for well-defined business roles, they have many scopes. There's always overlap. Somebody's kind of doing the role you're kind of doing. And so that level of security you have as a lawyer isn't there. Um, and so I was lucky. That's, I'm not sure that's that, that is that typical, but I, for that reason, kind of double did it until I was just ready to say enough. For the chief of staff position, and this is a common theme with the chief of staff positions at my company, um, you don't know what your next step is. And the point of the role is to make sure, is to give you an opportunity to see across, right? You see all the different places, the work that the company does. So it's a calculated risk. I was hoping that I'd get a job, well, let me rephrase it. The expectation that I had at the time was that I would have some role back in the legal department, in the law department, as a lawyer. But as I transitioned through the first GC, the second GC, and the third GC, what my interests were and what the opportunities were and what I thought I wanted to do for myself 
changed. And so the position that I have is not a lawyer, a traditional lawyer position, but it is a calculated risk. But you can control that calculation by networking and continuing to maintain relationships with the lawyers in the department so that if something does come up as you're transitioning back, that they know who you are, they know what you're doing, and if something comes up, then you'll have that opportunity. So it's a calculated risk, but you can mitigate that by networking, as well as just keeping your finger and understanding what's going on. I was terrified. I was, I, I think it's very, it is, it's, we're risk adverse. I'm sorry, lawyers aren't risk adverse. We, you know, we went to law school. I wanted to be a professional because I wanted that security. Um, and I, I think, to your point, I think it's, it's, it is, if you, if you change within your company, I think there's sort of that safety net that they know you and you could go back. Um, but it's, it's not, it's not easy. If you, but if you truly love what you're doing, then I say go for it. But it's not, yeah. I think one of the primary reasons I've like s started to look outside of law is wondering, although I think I solve problems at the end of the day, I spend a lot of the time before I solve the problem arguing. <laughs> and I always wonder if I move to a business role, if I would just be solving the problem arguing in a more pleasant way, or do you think you actually spend less time entrenched in conflict? I spend a lot of time in conflict. Um, <laughs> um, I'm, I'm in HR. Um, I, but even on the business side, I just think it, the people are human and they feel passionate about a point. Um, I do think on the business side, people listen to you a little bit more when you're making certain arguments because lawyers get the leeway of making arguments around a legal point, but there's even still that point where they're like, you're not taking enough risk, you don't understand. Whereas you're, if you're making that on the business side, I've always felt that there was a little bit more gravitas to the general strategic argument that I was making. Um, and so I wish I could uh, find a place of peace um, in that front, but no, unfortunately not for me. I mean, I think the skills you have as a lawyer, stood, you know, sort of stand you in good stead on the business side because um, at the end of the day, we're used to really building our arguments and thinking about the rationale, and so you always have arguments. So when you're on the business side, there are decisions to be made. There's always differing points of view, but what I love about it is that you get to make the decision, right? At the end, you don't just get to look at both sides. At the end of the day, you get to say, and this is what we're gonna do, and then you get to see what happens when you do it. And sometimes you have an epic fail, and you have to recover from that, and sometimes you know you make the right decision and you feel really good to see how you've been able to, to influence the business. But being able to kind of make a case for whatever, a business case, or um, and it's, it's the same as crafting an argument. You have to know your facts, you have to know your environment, you have to know what your competitors are doing, you have to know what the other side is gonna say, you have to anticipate what the naysayers are gonna say when you're making a business case. And so I think the skill sets are transferable. I don't know if it's, um, I think sometimes people feel like they wanna argue with their lawyer because the lawyers are preventing them from doing something that they wanna do a lot of the times. So maybe it seems less friendly. Um, so I think maybe that piece is not as clear on the business side because everyone just wants the business to succeed. Um, but we're always looking at opposing arguments. Hi, since you said that lawyers aren't trained to be managers, I'm curious what skills or how you achieved motivating others. I spent a lot of time talking to HR when I first got into the role because I recognized that it was a gap that I had. And so I wanted to make sure I understood what's the process for doing this and what are the tools and the resources that are available for me to be a good manager so that I'm telling people what they need and I'm motivating people. The other piece of it was the nature of the job that I had. My boss was very committed to talent development. And so I spent a lot of time developing talent development initiatives with him and working with my HR business partner to understand how to do that. So in addition to spending a lot of time with HR for my own benefit, I spent a lot of time developing programs to help the GC to be able to convey that to his team. So by osmosis and just working with that, that's how I learned how to do that. I will say prior to that, 
that, and, th and there are some things you can do if you can't get like this full immersion into HR. You can lead certain teams. So I was on the diversity committee and I was the chair of a subcommittee on the diversity committee. So then that's leading teams, understanding how to motivate people. So you can do those types of assignments. You can be like a project manager and leading a project and that's another way of motivating people and understanding how you get people to do what they need to do. So I did some of that before I got into the role. But doing that and then being in the seat of having HR responsibility, having to do comp, having to do um, feedback. At the end of the year, you have to be able to tell people what they did, what they didn't do, and why they got the rating they did and the money that they did. So in order to be able to justify that, I wanted to make sure I understood what I needed to do to make sure I, no one would be upset, or if someone left, I wouldn't get sued um, for that. We actually had, had a person on my team who had been a problem under my predecessor, and she's like, oh, I'm gonna get fired, blah, 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 and I said, look, we're starting new. I knew about the person and the issues that you had, but we're starting anew. But then after that, I went to my HR business person. I said, okay, what do I need to do to document if this doesn't work out, right? Do I put her on a plan? How do I document if she's not doing what she needs to do? So I did that outreach and had the plan in place, ultimately let her go. But she came up to me afterwards and she actually hugged me. I'm like, wow, you know, <laughs> she's leaving. But she said, you know, thank you for giving me that opportunity. I just realized this wasn't what I wanted to do. So I made sure to treat her with respect, gave her an opportunity to be able to figure out what she wanted to do. I mean, she ultimately, you can tell that she wasn't interested in what she was doing. She was really strong and then she, it was just like a nosedive. But I didn't judge her. She made the mistake, she realized where she needed to be and we exited her from the company. But it was being proactive and spending time talking to HR that helped me to be able to do that. And I think one of the biggest law firm failings is, um, well, I haven't been in a law firm since 2000, but at least since 2000, there were no management development programs. I actually have a little bit of a pet peeve because management is not, I like people and therefore I will be a good manager. Like when I am managing people, I had the great fortune of working at Reuters and going to a management development program a year. And then you're learning things like knowing yourself, like when are you acting like a big child? When do you have to come back in? Allowing your team to fail because you get the best success. Uh, you know, adopting the crazy ideas recognizing people's skill sets and saying, I'm lining this person's skill set up with the task I'm performing so that they are set up to succeed. Those are, you, are, you actually have to learn that. Um, and we, and, and I would say if you have any opportunity to go to the courses to learn it, because management is not this, you may have a natural affinity for it, but it is actually a learned skill and you have to bring that skill to the table. So we can teach it, and of course you can work with managers, and if they have the affinity, you can get there. But I would treat it like as if you were learning to be a lawyer, or as if you're learning to be an accountant, and I think we make the mistake of not doing that. Going back to networking, do you find that business people network differently than lawyers do? I'll let you switched over? I, I think that business people network more, right? So I, I have gotten very comfortable saying to someone when, I, when I'm in a new role, I, look, you have a, you're only new for a very small time period, and you gotta, you got to say, I, can, you walk, can you sit down for half an hour and walk me through, blah, blah, blah. I really actually didn't understand half the vocabulary words that were used in that meeting, right? So, but it's things like that where I think maybe guys don't like asking for help, but they, are, they go, they network, right? And they do it more. And so I have started, it's interesting Noah's observation about how important it is, but like I think of it as part of my job, right? So I used to be like, I'm a working mom. I have two small kids at home. I do not need to make more friends. I have lots of friends. I don't need to spend a lot of time at the company. I'm gonna come in. I'm going to do my work and I'm going to leave and I don't anymore. Um, if people ask me to have lunch, I always make time to have lunch with them. In fact, I try to like go out for drinks sometimes and not go home and see my kids every night. Um, it, it matters, right? I mean, guys do those things. They do not feel guilty about, I mean, anyone who's married and has kids knows your husband does not feel bad if he has a work event and he doesn't come home to help put the kids to bed, right? So we shouldn't feel guilty about that either. First of all, the kids are fine. And second of all, um, sometimes they need to see their dads. Um, and uh, it, it just, I don't think it's that they do it differently. I just think they do it more and they do it very naturally in a, in a different 
way because you need to know everyone. And in any environment, especially big corporate environments, Pfizer is a big company, how you get your work done is based on who you know. And if you don't know a person and you are constantly reaching across to different teams and trying to learn something from them or hearing something that they're doing that can help you with your work, and if you don't network, you don't even know about that stuff that's out there. So I, I just think it's, it's how you have to work if you live in the business world. You, the more people you know, the easier it is to get your job done. Can I add to that, though? I, I have to say, I, went, I was invited, when I was on the legal side, I was invited to business networking events. And I wanted to make up a fake title because the minute I said I was an attorney, people turned away. So I was like, maybe I'll be a strategic thinker. I don't know. So I, I think internally within the company, it's easy to network. I think sometimes outside, it's not as easy. So, but, but again, it's not you. Just know that. Networking is about creating relationships. And, and that was the point that I think we should have take away from what Melissa said. And networking is a way to facilitate that. Now, that doesn't mean you have to always go out and, and drink with the folks or always go to lunch. I mean, you certainly need to do that. But if you have a relationship with someone, you, you've worked with someone on a matter, they're your business partner. If something comes up that you think they should know about, send them an email. You know, I saw this. I thought you might be interested in this. There are ways that you can develop the relationship, which is what networking is about, without always having to do FaceTime. I mean, you know, FaceTime's important. You need to eyeball people people and people get that feel for you. But there are other things you can do if you're an introvert and you're, you always don't want to be out there talking to people to let people know I care, I'm thinking about you. But it's about developing that relationship. And I, I made that mistake. I would be so focused on my work that when my boss asked me out for lunch, I'd be like, uh, I have to work. And then I'd be like, what am I doing? So just remember that it's, those relationships are key. I guess I'll just make one more quick comment, which it's a two-way street, right? When someone asks me for help, I never say no, right? So it's not that I'm going out there and I'm asking people for things all the time. I used to really not, I'm like, what is networking? People are always talking about networking. I don't get it. I have a huge network. I know tons of people. What, 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 do, what do you do with your network, right? So it is about building relationships and it's about caring about what happens in the business. So I care that the business succeeds and because of that, when someone asks me for help, I help them. And also because of that, and people know that I have a reputation for doing that, and I will always make the time to do that, people are willing to help you too when you need it, right? Um, and it's how you go about it, and it's kind of the way you do it matters. So I don't, it's not that I go around asking people for things all the time, but it sort of happens naturally. I'll be like, hey, I saw you did blah, blah, blah the other day. That was a really great presentation. Do, do, could you walk me through some of that a little bit later? I'd like to learn more, right? And so there's, there's different ways to do it, I think, and you have to find your own personal style and what works for you. Yeah, I'm curious if your colleagues respect the boundaries that you are in a business role and how often they ask, they expect that you give legal advice or give give answers that incorporate legal advice. And then, the second question I have is, how many of you have kept up your legal licenses and CLEs and renew every two years? I keep mine up um, out of habit. Um, I, they, I actually, whether or not they respect it, I think that's a, actually a really great point. Is that you have to respect it because you're not the company lawyer. Um, you do not want to destroy privilege. Uh, it's, it's way too difficult. So for company legal reasons and my protection and theirs, I am actually very clear that I am, you know, I'm not giving legal advice. I will copy the lawyers in and say it is, somebody actually sent me an email the other day. I haven't been acting as a lawyer in a year and a half. And they said, we're copying in Karen for privilege. I'm like, I'm sorry, that's not going to work on this. Um, that's unfortunate, especially given the tone of the email. Um, <laughs> Um, but it's reminding people and putting the lawyers back on and redirecting them. It's a really important point as you change over because it's easy to blur that line. I maintain my license, but I was still in the legal department even though I wasn't a practicing lawyer. And, it, and you always want to maintain it. You, you don't know what your career is going to, where it's going to go, and you may need to have that license. And then going back to Kara's point, for, there, for all the reasons I identify for privilege, you, you stay in your lane. If people ask you legal questions, you can say, well, I think blah, but, you know, let me go and get 
the lawyer who's the subject matter expert so that they're getting the right advice. So you can steer people and kind of maybe prep them a little bit, but make sure, you, I'm, I'm, no, I'm, I'm giving you to the lawyer so they can make sure they're giving you the right advice. And if privilege is needed, you want to make sure that the privilege is maintained. Yes, going back to the management question, I was recently actually in a non-business interview and the question was, have you managed a large group of people and can you manage a large group of millennials? <laughs> Comment on that. Karen, that might be you. <laughs> and this was in an industry that you're a similar industry. Um, oh my gosh, wow. Um, how to do this without keeping people late. Um, uh, you know, it, it, well, one thing I'll say on the, on the management, because people always say if you manage a large group of people, and frequently lawyers get in this loop because not a lot of lawyers have had the opportunity to manage large groups. So, and that I think it's talking more about the large projects that I have worked on where I had to manage a number of people to make sure the project worked. Um, and some of you know the smaller management. People manage their assistants. People forget about that, and that's like a really important job as well. So it's finding the ways to answer that. Millennials, uh, there are many here. So um, they, uh, it's it's um, it's great. <laughs> there's there's there's. I think. You, <laughs> I, well, it's, I'm, now this is my epic fail. Um, <laughs> No, I mean, I think the question comes up because they're, they're so different. You know, I, um, when I started, I would show up at the law firm in 1995 with a pad and, yes, partner, what do you want? And I will work and I'm not expected to get promoted next year because I'm expecting at least a three-year cycle. And millennials have a much faster pace and expectation. And so managing millennials, I think there's a, there's a you want to have them there because some, they're brilliant and great ideas, but you're having to manage that expectation that there's not a promotion or a raise happening literally every six months. And that's a very, and I, I say that literally, that's a very, that's a very, very, very tricky thing, which is why I think that question is a great question. It comes up. Thank you so much. Thank you to the panelists. This was fantastic. Thank you everyone for coming. Um, we have a cocktail reception if someone opens the doors. <laughs> um, so please stick around and, uh, and, and, and ask more questions. Thank you so much. Thank you.